happened today. Hemisphere Park illuminated with colorful lanterns as people gathered to support blood cancer patients. The annual Light the Night Walk is bringing together survivors and supporters. The night team's Camelia Juarez shares the stories that bring light to the darkness of cancer. Light the Night, San Antonio. Just below Hemisphere. <laughs> Red, yellow, white lanterns sparkled through the crowd. The red lanterns for support, gold for remembrance, and white for survivors, each a symbol of hope and celebration. Remembering how I felt during treatment, how I felt when I was first diagnosed, to now seeing, again, the support, um, the people here who are just walking just because, um, just to be a part of it, that's amazing. Maggie Rodriguez proudly holds a white lantern, sharing a spark of hope. Can do it. If it's possible for me, it's possible for you. It brings her to tears to stand alongside people who can relate to her challenging journey. Thousands of people are carrying their lights to raise money and awareness for blood cancers. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is raising over $800,000 to find a cure and improve the lives of survivors. Well, we call her our queen bee. Chiquina Barrera lost her mother last year, so her family holds the gold lanterns high. But at us seeing so many people come together, not only raising money, but awareness. You're here together in solidarity, and so it's really nice. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. All I have to say is that was pretty cool. Yeah, it really was. And there were a lot of events today. I was at that fentanyl walk, and yeah. this this weather could not have been more perfect for that, for the eclipse. I mean, we really... talk about the eclipse. That's what I thought. Okay. Cool. <laughs> the eclipse was amazing. And yes, you're right. There were so many events happening across South yes. Central Texas. I was so happy that we were able to have a presence at a lot of them. It was beautiful weather. It was pretty windy earlier this morning, but they did settle down a bit into the afternoon. And yes, we did have a few stubborn clouds, but they cleared or at least broke up enough here in San Antonio by the time the annular eclipse was really taking shape to get some great photos and viewing. Here is a picture of what that looked like from Hondo. Again, so what happened today was the moon moved in front of the sun and it blocked just enough of the sun to only see a ring of fire on the edge. It looked absolutely amazing. I love this photo. Everybody's got their glasses out, eclipse from Hidden Forest, and then you got to check this one out with the cat too. Had plenty of glasses for the pets. Thank Thank you to everybody that sent in your photos to KSAT Connect. If you would like to do the same, you can do that on your KSAT Weather Authority app or KSAT.com slash connect. We would love to see them. All right, what we've been talking about with the eclipse got a little dark, wasn't completely dark, but you could tell it wasn't as bright. And the temperature actually did drop a little bit as the eclipse was happening. Here in San Antonio, we dropped by about two degrees, four degrees in Hondo, five over in New Braunfels. So yes, that was pretty cool. And of course, it felt amazing with the low humidity we had in place. Temperatures right now, speaking of which, in the low 60s already for us here in the Alamo City, mostly clear skies. It feels like 63 degrees as well because we've got the drier air in the works too. Tomorrow it is going to be a cool and crisp morning and even a little chilly, especially as we head into the Monday and Tuesday time frame into next week. And then especially by Thursday, we start to see those overnight lows come up just a little bit more thanks to the fact that we're going to start to see some more humidity work its way into the region. But first, here's a look at your Sunday morning. Stepping out for any morning plans, you will want the long sleeve. Low to mid 50s expected for most. 55 here in San Antonio, stretching over to Floresville, 56 in Pleasanton, 52 in Canyon Lake. We are going to see plenty of sunshine throughout the day. 63 degrees by 10 a.m. At lunchtime, we're sitting at about 70. And then we've got a forecast high pointed around 77 here in town. 77 in Seguin as well. 78 in Sabinal and 70 five in comfort, maybe a few degrees cooler off to our northwest up into the hill country. It also will be a bit breezy tomorrow. I think we could see some more wind gusts generally upwards of about 25 to maybe even 30 miles per hour. Those winds coming in from the north and then as we head into your Sunday afternoon, especially late afternoon and into the evening, we'll start to see some of those winds die down just a little bit more. After that, you can see Monday and Tuesday still looking gorgeous. Plenty of sunshine 
sunshine, copy and paste conditions. We're going to start off chilly near about 50 degrees. High temperatures climbing only into the upper 70s. Very pleasant out there. Then we start to warm things up ever so slightly by Wednesday and no. Thursday, maybe an isolated chance for rain. And then after that, maybe a little bit warmer, but still not too bad. You can't say 70s and then we get warmer. It's not fair. At least it's not 90. Okay, all right. It's not 100. Yeah. It's the middle of October. It's not supposed to be 90. Hey, right. we're, we're getting better, though. We're getting okay. better. Okay, I'm Tim Gerber today, apparently. There you go. All You're right. tired. You've been out there doing things all day. I've been sitting here watching football. I'm Speaking grumpy. of football, the Roadrunners say there's no place like home. That's right. It was a long-awaited return for UTSA as they hosted UAB tonight for a primetime AAC matchup inside of the Alamo Dome, and the Roadrunners wasted no time dazzling their home crowd. Plus, we have plenty of high school football action to get to, including fifth-ranked Harlan taking on home. Zeno throwing quickly to the other side, and it's the same result. Donye Taylor back to back tackles for loss. UTSA came out guns blazing against UAB for an electric return to the Alamo Dome after a month away, right now in Big Board Sports. He dropped 21 on Miami last night in their preseason game, and tonight Spurs guard Devin Vassell is front and center for a primetime battle between UTSA and UAB. UTSA looking for its second straight win and a great start for the Roadrunners. Robert Henry 19 yards up the middle for the touchdown. Later, UAB getting absolutely smothered by the Roadrunners defense. Two consecutive tackles for loss, then Trey Moore forces a fumble, and it takes one try for UTSA to turn the turnover into points. Harris to Joshua Cephas in the end zone. Roadrunners up 14 to 0. Blazers QB Jacob Zeno, a product of San Antonio, responded for UAB with a three yard rushing TD. UTSA led 24 to 13 at the half and held on to the lead, defeating the Blazers 41 to 20 to stay perfect in conference play. All right, switching gears now to the high school football slate that kicked off today around San Antonio, starting with the fifth ranked Harlan Hawks taking on Holmes. The Holmes defense trying to slow down Harlan's speed, but that's easier said than done as Peyton Matthews takes this reverse 55 yards to the house just before halftime. There was plenty more where that came from the rest of the afternoon as Harlan would go on to win it big. 49 to 12, the Hawks stay undefeated going into week nine. Over at Alamo Stadium, the McCullum Cowboys looking to bounce back after a tough loss to Burbank. But when Sam Houston's Jeremiah Espedia is locked in like this coming out of halftime, you know he's about to do something big. The Hurricanes get it to Espedia on the sweep. He cuts back inside and finds a lane down the sideline and doesn't get tackled until he's already gone 63 yards for the touchdown. And Sam Houston gets the big district win over McCollum, 28 to 22. And for the nightcap, the Stevens Falcons looking to snap a three game losing streak, but the Brennan Bears are on a three game district win streak and they're doing everything they can to protect that. How about the first play from scrimmage for the Bears? Handing it off to Makai Thompson. He takes it up the middle for a 34 yard touchdown. Then on the next possession, some more of the Bears running game. This time, Jason Love sprints in for the TD. Brennan dominates this game, winning 49 to 7. was able to salvage a draw against Indy 11 with a late equalizer as SCFC's regular season finishes um, with the 3-3 three to three draw. Those are the three scores for San Antonio. And as a result of just getting one point, the defending champs fail to clinch the two seed in the West and they await the conclusion of tonight's games for their postseason fates. Now later in the night, B, we'll take a look at Texas A&M's disappointing loss to number 19 Tennessee and Texas State defeats um, ULM and then Incarnate Word dazzles in front of its home crowd for its fifth straight win. 
No ties in those games, I'm sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Plus, wrongfully terminated is what a CPS employee says happened to him coming up. He gave KSAT Investigates the audio to prove it. We'll share it with you next when the night beat continues. A former CPS Energy spokesman says he was targeted at work and later fired for failing to turn over private medical information to the company's security staff. To be blatantly honest, I feel like CPS Energy is very comfortable in their way of terminating people, wrongfully terminating people. Ruben Betancourt telling KSAT Investigates he was simply following the instructions of Human Resources and has provided the audio to prove it. <laughs> In late April of last year, less than two weeks after having an emergency appendectomy, bilingual communications specialist Ruben Betancourt showed up at CPS Energy headquarters for the utility's monthly board meeting. Still feeling a little, little off, a little bad. After entering the building, Betancourt said he temporarily misplaced his security badge. Although he later found it, the small misstep would have a big impact on his brief tenure with the company. The next day, Betancourt said he was summoned back to headquarters by CPS's security operations team. They began interrogating me, asking me um, questions of like what was going on that day, um, you know, just different things that we thought you were suspicious. CPS officials contend they uncovered security video footage of Betancourt attempting to drive into its garage through the exit gate. The narrative you thought they were trying to build is that you showed up to work under the influence. Right, correct. Next, he says, came a request from security for Betancourt to hand over a list of all of his prescribed medications. Betancourt, who has a diagnosed mental illness, believed the demand went too far. Here is a portion of one of Betancourt's calls with security. Okay, so just to be clear and, you know, I gave you till, give me until five o'clock today to uh, provide that information. So are you just re refusing to provide it or declining? Betancourt instead contacted the company's human resources department and again recorded the conversation. You're, you're going to work with me going forward. Okay. Um, okay. I'm, Perfect. I, I am, I'm going to, yeah, um, work with me. You don't provide them any information, especially asking for medical documentation, everything that on a medical side, um, you know, with our HIPAA laws. Betancourt says he eventually complied with the request and turned over a list of his prescribed meds to HR and the company's manager of occupational health. He also filed a complaint against the security team and was quickly placed on administrative leave. I basically felt alone um, in this corporation. I just felt like I was belittled, I was targeted. Um, nobody was there to vouch for me. Betancourt returned to work last summer after completing fitness for duty paperwork, but said he walked into a cold, hostile environment. That July, just days before completing his probationary work period, Betancourt was fired for not safeguarding his badge and for failing to cooperate with the subsequent investigation. Betancourt says he lost his medical insurance and his car and temporarily experienced homelessness. I was compliant um, to the fullest with HR and occupational health. And it's interesting because that should have been the right procedure from the get-go. They shouldn't have been trying to pry this um, medical information um, from me. For Case that Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. Betancourt filed a federal disability discrimination claim against CPS Energy. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission closed it in August without making a determination on whether the company violated his rights. The EEOC instead issued a right to sue letter. To date, Betancourt has not filed suit against CPS and no legal determination has been made in connection to his claim that the company wrongfully terminated him. He said half of the attorneys he's reached out to so far have cited a conflict of interest in taking a case against the utility company. CPS officials declined an interview request from KSAT, stating it does not comment on personnel issues. A proposed gag order, gag order against former President Donald Trump is creating a sticky situation for the judge overseeing the federal election interference case. 
Judge Tanya Chutkin must balance the need to protect the legal proceedings in the case against the right for the former president to defend himself in public. Trump's lawyers have called the proposed gag order a desperate effort at censorship, but Chutkin has insisted she will not let political considerations interfere in her decision. Those arguments over the proposal will be heard on Monday. And a new AP NORC poll shows an investigation into Hunter Biden's business dealings and an ongoing presidential impeachment inquiry are casting a shadow over President Biden in his hopes of being reelected. 35 percent of the people polled say Biden has done something illegal. Another 33 percent say they think the president has behaved unethically. And the last 30 percent say Joe Biden has done nothing wrong. Halloween is a time for kids to dress up and have fun trick-or-treating, but that's not the case for everyone. How a local group is making is working to make sure that young patients have a fun Halloween and how you can help. A childhood tradition interrupted by illness. Young patients are often forced to spend Halloween in a hospital room, but one nonprofit is working to make sure they'll still have some fun. The night team's John Paul Barajas explains their efforts and how you can help. I didn't know what it meant like when I started it, but now I know what it means. At four years old, Gilbert Edetta was diagnosed with leukemia. Two years later, he's in remission and got to ring the bell to celebrate the end of treatments last month. We're thankful for the organizations that have been around to help us through it because you just go through the motions and you just put him first. It's groups like the Stay Strong Foundation creating bright spots in dark times. This year, Stay Strong is providing patients with Halloween costumes and bringing a Halloween party to those who can't go trick-or-treating. I'd be staring at them with this big cat head. <laughs> they would laugh. And it, was, it, was really, it was a really cool time. It was very needed in a, in a space like that. For Bryce Fox, dressing up and laughing with other patients like him was more than a morale boost. It was a distraction from the tumor in his pelvis. While some may take the festivities for granted, Stay Strong Board President Debbie Harper says being able to celebrate Halloween goes a long way for those in the hospital something she learned firsthand from her son. The day before he went into the hospital, he wanted to do something. And so he put it out on Facebook and he said, hey, you know, we need costumes for these kiddos here because they're kind of isolated. That was three years ago. Since then, Stay Strong has collected Halloween costumes for pediatric patients at University Hospital. This year, their goal bigger than ever, 400 costumes to let kids be kids, even in tough times. October was really fun because everybody looked forward to seeing what he would be dressed up as next. Most of them were superheroes. Most of them were superheroes, yeah. Do you know what you're going to be for Halloween this year? He wants to be James Bond. I think we all want to be James Bond. <laughs> John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Awesome kid, for sure. The Stay Strong Foundation is collecting donations through October 22nd. And you can donate by texting costumes to the number you see on your screen there, 53555, or by clicking the link on our website at ksat.com. I think you would be a pretty awesome. I do too. Yeah. James Bond Jr. There you go. <laughs> I love it. All right, taking a look outside with live cam. We've got mostly clear skies in place across the majority of South Central Texas right now. Temperatures falling pretty efficiently already because of that. Right now we're in the low 60s here in town. This morning we started off at about 65, totally waiting for that drier air to fully take over. It did so today. Yes, it was windy this morning, but that low humidity made it feel pretty nice outside. Our high temperature 82, somewhat seasonable for this time of year. Our average high is 83. It was 80 out east in Gonzales, 81 in Katsula, 78 in Uvalde, 77 in Carrizo Springs, 73 though, Southern Edwards Plateau up in Rock Springs out there in Edwards County. Now generally as we head into the back half of the weekend for your Sunday and even into the beginning of next week, highs in the upper 70s, even near 80 are expected. Still low humidity and plenty of sunshine. Gorgeous fall weather will continue. We'll get you all those details in a bit. Finally reached the best part of the year. Yes, a little bit of fall. Are mm. you finally happy, Tim? Is I this okay with you? The, 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 the exact part of the year where I'm like happy. 
Wow. I don't even know what to... How long it'll last, so we'll just catch it in a bottle and let it last. I was going to say, I guess we just have to enjoy it while we've got it. Right. Exactly. Yes, so it has been a gorgeous start to the weekend today. Comfortable temperatures, dry air in place, but it was pretty windy this morning, all following the front that we had move in last night. Here's a look at peak wind gusts across South Central Texas here in San Antonio. We had a peak wind gust around 24 miles per hour. Check out Gonzales, New Braunfels and Rock Springs. Peak wind gusts clocking in around 30 miles per hour. Definitely was a morning to hold on to your hats as you were stepping out for any eclipse watch parting plans. Now tomorrow it is still going to be windy at times 25 to 30 miles per hour possible. And then that wind's going to start to subside a little bit more by late tomorrow afternoon and into the evening. Fall weather is going to continue over the next several days. Cool mornings, very pleasant afternoons and plenty of sunshine and blue skies. That drier air will continue continue through at least Tuesday before we start to see some of that humidity work back in. And speaking of drier air, this time yesterday we were really starting to see that fully move in to the Alamo City. You can see a look at dew points now compared to where we were just 24 hours ago, about 5 to even 10 degrees lower, which essentially just means we have that drier air in the works. Temperatures falling because of that here. 57 in Bull Verde already 62 out east in Converse 63 at Stinson there on the south side 62 in Uvalde right now and 61 in Bandera as we head into the overnight hours we are just going to continue to fall 50s for most I do think it's possible though especially north of San Antonio maybe a few upper 40s not completely out of the question so if you're stepping out first thing tomorrow you're likely going to want the long sleeve but by the afternoon you're not going to need it plenty of sunshine and a high temperature around 77 for us here in town 75 in Gonzales 79 in Pleasanton maybe down the I-35 corridor 80 degrees in Catula stretching over to Laredo as well and you can see we're just going to copy and paste those conditions Monday into Tuesday then we're just a little bit warmer as we head into the middle to later portions of next week and we have a small chance for a stray storm on Thursday let's talk about that you can see we are quiet right now across South Central Texas a little bit of a different story off to our northeast near New York stretching over to Washington DC. There's some scattered rain and thunderstorm activity tracking eastward, but there's this high pressure system off to our west. This is going to be in control as it moves across the desert southwest Monday and into Tuesday and it continues to work eastward by Wednesday. So that's why we're expected to be pretty quiet with plenty of sunshine. But then we look at this low pressure system by Thursday that approaches the Great Lakes region that looks to drop a boundary into South Central Texas by Thursday afternoon. We've just got a 20% potential for an isolated shower or storm to pop up. Not too significant. It's something we'll monitor plan on the next seven days being pretty dry for us here in San Antonio. Until then, enjoy tomorrow and the couple of days following that because yes, fall weather is here and it feels fantastic outside guys. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing sweaters even if it's still 78, 82. Courtney's Longhorns were off this weekend, so we can't pick on her, but yeah. Mia's uh, <laughs> okay. Aggies came up short. Wah, wah. <laughs> oh, man, that was brutal. It's yes. fun when it's somebody else. <laughs> yeah. on the weather, so. uh, okay, Mia's nice. It's not as fun when it's Mia because she's too nice. Hey, Iowa State won today, so that's where my fan okay. lies. Uh, but, yes, more college football highlights coming up as the Aggies come up short in their attempt to upset number 19, Tennessee. And UIW gets the final word in a winning effort over Texas A&M Commerce. Clint Killow's squad is on fire. The Texas A&M football team brings its top 10 defense to Knoxville for an SEC battle with 19th ranked Tennessee. There is Max Johnson scrambling, then diving across the goal line for the first score of the game. The Bulls tied it late in the opening quarter. A&M now up three, and there goes Fadil Diggs. He sacks Joe Milton on the Bulls' fourth and seven attempt later. Aggies forced to punt from the back of the end zone. And D. Williams returns the 38-yard punt for the touchdown. The Aggies had every chance to win this game, but Johnson threw two picks in the fourth quarter, and Tennessee wins it 20-13. The Aggies drop to 4-3, and three, 
overall. The Roadrunners wreaked havoc onto UAB as soon as the primetime AAC matchup kicked off inside of the Alamo Dome. We expected this to be a close game like it has been historically between the two programs, but the difference for UTSA was the big plays made by the defense. Linebacker Trey Moore had a fumble recovery and four sacks on UAB's Jacob Pizzino, while Frank Harris threw for 171 yards with no interceptions. The Roadrunners capture the 41 to 20 win after the game. Head coach Jeff Trailer was very happy with his team performance. Yeah, it took us six games, but you know we finally put together our first complete game of the entire season. So that was good to see. We were really good defensively. You know, we gave up a reverse, gave up a double pass. Um, other than that, we were pretty spot on solid. And uh, they made some great contested catches. They're a really good football team offensively. And I was really proud of our defense. Over at Benson Stadium, Incarnate Word was rocking its all-black unis today, hosting Texas A&M Commerce. The UAW offense went to work early. Zach Calzada throws a screen pass to Jarrell Wiley, who uses his blockers and gets in for the 13-yard touchdown. After a few possessions where both teams were forced to punt, the Cardinals put together a successful drive just before halftime. Calzada airs it out to C.J. Hardy, who comes down with it on top of the defender who had a lot to say to him before on the play. In the end, the Cardinals come out victorious, 28-11, to improving to 5-1 on the season. Out at Bobcat Stadium, Texas State kicker Mason Shipley did all of the scoring for the Bobcats through the first three quarters with three field goals. ULM owned a 20 to nine lead into the fourth quarter until the Bobcats scored two late touchdowns for a narrow 21 to 20 win. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. We have plenty of confidence. I'm, you know, I don't think this this team lacks confidence. I think it's just. Um, you know, getting started faster. Um, you know, I think obviously that starts up front. You know, we didn't get off to a good start, and that stuff rolls down to, to the rest of the team. So we, we got to put a premium of coming out and starting fast and, and getting in a rhythm early. The Dallas, look, Dallas looking to get back on track on Monday Night Football against the Chargers. We'll be right back. All right, a cool and crisp morning expected first thing tomorrow. Beautiful sunshine throughout the day, a high around 77. It will be a little windy in the morning and even into the afternoon, but it'll settle down later in the day. Copy and paste that Monday and Tuesday, and then we'll warm things up with an isolated chance for rain as we head into the Thursday time frame, guys. No cool things happening in the sky, just cool weather, and that's fine with me. Yeah, that's fine with me, too. I don't know what to do with Happy Tim. This is so weird. It's strange. Yeah. <laughs> that's all we have tonight. <laughs> We need to move on. Not happy about being here at 1137 if we really, really get into it.